Hey, aloha and welcome to Stan the Energy Man here on Think Tech Hawaii. Um, in case you're kind of questioning my sanity regarding the title of this show, um, yeah, I'm, I'm sane. Um, but most of you probably never thought about the relationship of ammonia to energy other than how much elbow grease it takes to scrub your floors in your bathroom or something using ammonia. You know, ammonia is a, a really... Uh, useful and amazing thing for a lot of reasons. We need it in agriculture to make fertilizer. Um, of course, it's got a household purpose for around the house. And there's probably a whole bunch of old um, saws from old folks that tell you how to use ammonia to, to do everything from curing a common cold to, you know, cleaning up after your dog and cat. But ammonia is a really versatile chemical. And it's been around so long that we really have all the safety protocols for it. But it is very useful in energy. So today's guest uh, is Dan Goen. Uh, seems to be we have him here all the time and that's a good thing as far as I'm concerned. And um, in fact, we're gonna probably change the name of the show to Stan and Dan the Energy Men um, because I have him here all the time. But Dan, thanks for being on the show. And you know, you've got the handle on how we make ammonia and the story of what the different uses are. But I wanna capsulize for the audience first that in, in terms of hydrogen, which everybody knows if you watch the show more than once is my favorite favorite thing is hydrogen. Um, hydrogen is one of those things that's very hard to um, contain because, and I'll use a real technical engineering term, it's really fluffy. Um, it, it's very buoyant um, and you've either got to compress it to 10,000 PSI or higher to squish it into a container where you can cram enough hydrogen in there to make it useful. And liquid hydrogen is, um, I once asked a bunch of uh, natural gas people if you could use uh, natural gas, um, what they call doers or the uh, thermoses, the whole liquid hydrogen like you can with liquid um, natural gas. And they said, well, Stan, natural gas is cold. Hydrogen is really, really freaking cold. You know, it's like, magnitude of, of degree higher cold. So the problem with hydrogen, like I said before, is compression and having to squeeze it into those little containers or having to turn it into a liquid. But one of the other ways you can turn it into a liquid is to make ammonia, which if you remember from chemistry class is NH3. So three nitrogen atoms or three hydrogen atoms and one nitrogen atom and the the air that we breathe is like 70 something percent nitrogen. So nitrogen's all around you. So it's just a process of taking some of that nitrogen from the air and turning it into with hydrogen into ammonia. So Dan's gonna go through some stuff and kind of give us the nuts and bolts of how that process works and maybe some of the utility for hydrogen. So hit it Dan, it's all yours. <laughs> Thanks Dan. So those uh, the folks out there that are kind of wondering what the screen is behind me, that's a uh, control system for a GE gas turbine. So I use that as my, my background. So it's, it's I'm a utility guy. So uh, we're gonna jump into talking about um, about uh, um, about ammonia, uh, anhydrous ammonia, and we'll also talk a little bit about uh, cryogenic hydrogen and the difference between pressurized hydrogen and the cryogenic hydrogen uh, that everybody seems to, that everybody knows a lot about. So some of this I've already written down, so I'm gonna read it off and then we're gonna talk about it. And then I'm gonna go through some of the history of this hydrogen. It's a lot of history that most of the public doesn't, doesn't know about. So uh, throughout the 19th century, the demand for nitrates and ammonia for use as fertilizers and industrial feedstock had been steadily increasing. Uh, the main source was mining nitrate deposits and guano deposits from uh, tropical islands. So a lot of the islands out in the South Pacific were actually mined for the guano, from the, from the seabirds laying guano in their, their nesting areas. And a lot of those islands were basically, the habitats were destroyed from these birds just mining uh, nitrates from. Um, at the beginning of the 20th century, it, it had been predicted that the reserves could not satisfy future needs. In fact, they were predicting by 1920 that they could have mass starvation because there was a shortage of fertilizers throughout the world. And this was at a time when the population of the earth was only about 1.5 billion people. So you can imagine how acute this situation could become today if it, if it ever became an issue again. Uh, uh, there was a lot of new research, uh, right? So it could not, okay. So, and research into the new potential sources of ammonia uh, started becoming very important. So although atmospheric nitrogen 
is abundant and comprising nearly 80% of the air that we breathe. It is exceptionally stable and does not readily react with other chemicals. Uh, converting um, nitrogen into ammonia posed a, a pretty significant challenge for the chemists globally throughout the world. Uh, Professor Haber, Fritz Haber, if I can uh, get you to show uh, page number two, please. Okay, Fritz Haber and Carl Bach. So, uh, Professor Fritz Haber, with his assistant uh, Robert Lee uh, Rosengall, developed the high pressure devices and catalysts needed to demonstrate the Haber process at laboratory scale. They demonstrated their process in the summer of 1909 by reducing ammonia from the air drop by drop at a rate of about 125 milliliters per hour. The process was purchased by a German chemical company called BASF, which uh, signed a young man at that time, Carl Bosch, uh, the task of scaling up the harbor process from a tabletop machine to an industrial level production. Now, that gentleman there, Carl Bosch, he's also the founder of the Bosch Chemical Company. Uh, which today in Europe is a significant uh, participant in the hydrogen community and the hydrogen fuel cell community. In fact, the engineers that are behind the Nikola semi truck are Bosch engineers, right? So that's how far some of this history goes back. So we're going to talk about players that today are players in the hydrogen world, and they were, you know, that a lot of this history goes back over 100 years. Uh, Okay, which assigned Carl Bach okay, is that's okay, okay. He succeeded in 1910. Uh, Harbor, uh, uh, Professor Haber and Bosch were later awarded Nobel Prizes in 1918 and 1931, respectively, for their work in overcoming the chemical engineering problems of large scale continuous flow high pressure hydrogen technology. Can I get you to show slide number three, please? Okay. Ammonia was first manufactured and used the Haber process at an industrial scale in 1913 in BASF's output plant in Germany, reaching 200 tons per day. The following year, the, uh, politi the politics of ammonia led into World War I. Uh, Germany had a monopoly on ammonia, and the Allies had access to large deposits of sodium nitrate in Chile, that's Chile saltpeter, uh, controlled by British companies. Uh, Chile saltpeter, a soon be depleted resource in 1910. The reason why I'm pointing this out is a lot of the politics uh, with Germany having a monopoly on ammonia laid the political foundation for World War I. So understand that the subject we're talking about tonight actually was probably the foundation for starting a world war, right? And it had to do with food security because Germany was going to have a monopoly on fertilizer production for the world. Uh, today, today, the most popular catalysts are, and if I can get you to show slide number three again, please. Okay. Today, the most popular catalysts are based on iron promoted with uh, potassium oxide, calcium oxide, silicon dioxide, aluminum oxide, and so forth. Uh, that's a significant improvement over the original catalysts, which were based on uranium and osmium. So, uh, but, uh, but pretty much that was the, uh, a lot of those uh, catalysts that were developed back in 1913, they're still in use today. That, Pipe you see there on the left hand side, that's in front of the, uh, uh, I think it's the uh, German Technik University there in Germany. And that was one of the first reactors, uh, first ammonia reactor that was developed back in 1913. Is that and a person could, standing next to it? I think so. It's a pretty oh, big thing. Okay. Yeah. Uh, that, that reactor there used to, when they had it in production back in 1913, would produce 20 tons of ammonia per day. Wow. That was, that was a significant amount of ammonia, considering that the inputs for making that uh, were just natural gas, uh, air, and steam, okay, and maybe some electricity also. But anyway, if I can get you to show a graphic number, uh, slide number four, please. Okay. And that's what the process looks like today. And basically, the on the left-hand side, they take uh, steam, uh, natural gas, mix it with some air. Uh, they use a, there's a compressor on the left-hand side they're not showing. They'll actually pressurize it up to about uh, 100 bar, which is about 1,450 PSI. That first reactor there on the left-hand side, it's made out of nickel, has full of nickel ball bearings. They have to heat that up to 500 degrees Celsius. That's uh, 932 degrees, so they burn a lot of natural gas getting that up to temperature. And then once they pass the gases through that, they pass it through another compressor. 
uh, and then they lead it on to a, looks like a scrubber there, and they remove the water and the carbon dioxide from the gas. Um, and then once they do that, they put it into a, a, they pressurize it up to 200 bar, which is 2,900 PSI. And that's, uh, they maintain it at 450 degrees and then pull it into that reactor. Um, that, the initial process was developed by um, uh, Professor Haber was only about 5% efficient, meaning 5% of the gases they put in would actually be turned into ammonia. This device here is only 15% efficient, even today. So only 15% of the gases are actually turned into anhydrous ammonia. Now, at uh, 2,900 PSI, now remember, a liquid uh, uh, supercritical ammonia, turning ammonia into a liquid only requires 125 PSI. So, so liquid ammonia will collect in on the left, on the right hand side of the machine here where they drain the liquid ammonia and they just continuously have to recycle the gases. Uh, this device just, so like I said, it's only 15% efficient, but uh, the fertilizer business today, they consume 5% of the world's natural gas just making anhydrous ammonia with this process. Consider how much gas, natural gas it is. That's so, a lot. a lot, a huge amount. So if I can get you to show, um, let's see, slide number five here. Okay, that's from the Department of Energy. That's a 2019 figure. Now, <clears throat> as long as natural gas is less than $2 per million BTUs, this process is reasonable, and those figures I'm showing there on the screen that actually works out economically. But when you're today, I mean, even today, I think we finally got the natural gas prices to drop down about three dollars and fifty cents per million BTUs. It's mainly because everybody thinks we're having a light winter, but hey, we haven't hit January. Wait, wait till it gets cold, and you'll see natural gas prices go up. But when natural gas prices are three, four, five dollars, or even higher. This process becomes very un un uneconomical. Uh, as a case in point, there are four um, uh, uh, four fertilizer companies in Europe that have gone bankrupt this year already, and it's because of the cost of natural gas. So this entire process is, be is becoming uneconomical. This process based on natural gas. Uh, if I can get you to show uh, slide number six, please. And the only reason I put that in there is uh, kind of remind me of my roots uh, when I came out of the Department of Navy, when I went to Indianapolis, worked for Indianapolis Power and Light. One of the first power plants I worked on was this place here called Perry K. Uh, it's in downtown Indianapolis. It's across the street from Lucas Oil Stadium. So if you've ever been in Indianapolis, watch an NFL football game. This building is across the street. It's a sin gas plant. Uh, they use steam reforming uh, to produce sin gas. Sin gas is carbon monoxide and hydrogen. The, their main customer is Eli Lilly, and they pump syn gas, carbon monoxide, and hydrogen over to Lilly, and Lilly takes that complete gas and they polymerize it into plastics on pills, Lilly being one of the largest drug manufacturers in the world. Uh, the only reason I put that in here, I just wanted to make sure everybody understands that, that steam reforming is not a bad process if your end product is for a good use. The, the bad thing about using that whole steam reforming for using ammonia is they've got to remove that carbon dioxide and eventually do something with it, whether they're just venting into the air or they got to use CO2 sequestration. You got to do something with the CO2. The point about the, the Parakeet power plant there is all the gas goes to Lily and all of it gets turned into products, so none of it's released in the atmosphere. I'm just trying to make sure everybody understands Please don't throw the baby out with a bath, bath with the bath water, right? It's not a bad process. You just, you know, using it wisely is the important part. Here, whatever. Yeah, I don't want to get you off track, but just for a couple of seconds, can you talk about some of the other commercial uses for CO2? Because everybody thinks CO2 and greenhouse gases are all bad, bad, bad. Period. You got to get rid of everything. But we actually we have to use CO2 for a lot of things. Well, CO2 is a solvent. When you compress it to greater than 1,055 PSI, it turns into that supercritical fluid. I know on this program here, we talk about how they use it in oil wells for extracting even more oil out of, a, of an almost dead you know, oil well. That's one thing you can do with it. The other thing is it's, uh, they use it for extracting caffeine from coffee beans. So if you drink decaffeinated coffee, 
they use CO2 to remove that. So there's a lot of drug manufacturing processes where they use carbon dioxide as the solvent. And that doesn't include the utility uh, sector. There's a lot of different power systems out there that use carbon dioxide. For example, some of the new advanced uh, uh, geothermal uh, systems don't use water. They use supercritical CO2 as the working fluid. In other words, they pump high pressure carbon dioxide down on the ground, let the rocks heat it up. And when that gas comes back up, they run it through a turbine, like, like that gas turbine behind me, to make electricity. So there's a lot of uses for carbon dioxide. And that doesn't include all the things like soda pop and, and beverages and things like that, where it's very, very useful. And pressure so, cleaning pressure mechanical cleaning. equipment. Yeah. Yeah, okay. it's an all you can use it for for an alternative for for dry cleaning your clothes and stuff like that rather than using hazardous chemicals. One of the ways you can do it is with using CO2. So, mm -hmm. so it's a very useful chemical. It just goes back to how do you use it, and as long as you recycle it, it's it's a it's very useful and it's not harming the atmosphere. The other the other thing too is there are places where CO2 is actually used. For example, up in Iceland, they charge the greenhouses up there with carbon dioxide because it's great for the plants. Yeah. So it's great for pumping into your greenhouse. You want to you want your plants to grow well. They need carbon dioxide, and you just fill your carbon your greenhouse with carbon dioxide. So it's not not necessarily a bad thing. It just depends on how you use it. I can get you to show slide number seven, please. Okay, there's an alternative to that whole process using natural gas, and it uh, part of it has to do with this guy right here. There's a, a guy by the name of. Uh, Lugie Casale and George Clot. Now that picture there is George Clot. I think I couldn't find one of of uh, Lugie Casale as an Italian guy. Uh, but during the interwar years, there was an alternative process that was developed. And interwar meaning before World War One and World War Two. Uh, the most notably different being the uh, um, being the Lugie uh, uh, the Lugie Clot process. And um, Lugie, Lugie Casale and George Clot had proposed to increase the pressure of the synthesis loop up to a thousand bar, that's 15,000 PSI, thereby increasing the single pass ammonia conversion and making nearly complete liquefaction at ambient temperature feasible. So what does that mean? Well, well, first of all, this guy right here, George Claude, uh, he's actually the founder of a company called Air Liquid. It's a big, uh, yeah, they're during the hydrogen business in Europe, uh, nitrogen, oxygen, Back in the uh, 19th century, he won the Nobel Prize for discovering liquid nitrogen, liquid oxygen, liquid argon. He's the guy that created this machine that actually will compress air to the point it turns into a liquid. Uh, now, he had a heck of a try and try and create a compressor to compress hydrogen because he didn't understand this was the time before the molecular model, before Niels Bohr, before Albert Einstein. So they really didn't understand the nature of quantum physics and things like what we do today. But anyway, he had developed a process where he would take um, hydrogen, he would compress it up maybe up to a, a thousand PSI. He released the pressure when you let gases expand, they get cold. And basically using that same thing multiply multiple stages, he could get a certain quantity of the hydrogen to get cold enough to where it was liquid at room pressure. That's minus 423 degrees Fahrenheit. Now, the only downside of this process Let's say you start off with 100 liters of hydrogen, only about 10 liters of it are turned into, uh, turned into cryogenic hydrogen, right? So you have to recycle a lot of the hydrogen through it. So in other words, this process uses, um, uses a lot of energy just to create this uh, liquid hydrogen. Now, the only reason why they didn't use the process that I described this, uh, this uh, um, uh, the uh, Luigi Cassell and George Claude process is because the amount of energy it took to come up with liquid hydrogen. What they did was they took one of Fritz Harbor's uh, ammonia reactors and they poured liquid nitrogen and liquid hydrogen into the reactor and put in the, the shipping plugs in the reactor. And these gases, or these fluids, unless you keep them refrigerated, they'll turn into gases. So whenever that happens, the pressure shoots right on up. And when they notice that right around 15,000 PSI, that 90% of those gases in that reactor would turn into anhydrous ammonia. And, it, and that would happen at, at about 70 degrees Fahrenheit at room temperature. But the, the only part of this they weren't able to figure out is how do I build a compressor that compress hydrogen up to 15,000 PSI? And, and, and like I said, so, so George's Claude, he won the Nobel Prize for creating liquid hydrogen, but he was never able to figure out how to compress 
higher. So that was one of those mysteries that's been a mystery for about 150 years is how do you compress higher? And that was one of the big, bigger problems out there. So I, if I can get you to show uh, slide number eight, please. So back in 2019, I wrote a paper and sent it off to, uh, uh, to ARPA on how to use the electrum high dynamic compressor for creating anhydrous ammonia. Now, the inputs there on the left-hand side just says nitrogen and hydrogen. Now, the, uh, the nitrogen, the easiest thing to use for nitrogen is just using an air-liquid compressor that compresses air into liquid air and fractionally separating out the, uh, the nitrogen, okay? And the source of the hydrogen can be from electrolysis. So you've got uh, nitrogen from the air using a, a, a liquid air compressor to make the liquid air. And that way you've got pure nitrogen. You feed it, feed in some pure, uh, pure hydrogen from electrolysis into the electron high dynamic compressor, compress it up to 15,000 PSI, and anhydrous ammonia will form in that reactor at room temperature, 70 degrees Fahrenheit, uh, saving a significant amount of energy. Now, the reason why this is really, really important is look at the inputs to that system. The inputs are electricity, water, and air. That's the only, need, the only thing you need to produce anhydrous ammonia. Not only that, but look at the amount of energy that whole process will save. Why? Because the only energy input into that system is A, gonna be your liquid air compressor and the electrum high dynamic compressor. That's the, only, uh, that's the only energy you're gonna have to pump into there. Not only that, but the anhydrous ammonia, the liquid ammonia that you get out of this device Right, you don't have to cool it down. It's already going to be down at room temperature. And so you can drain liquid anhydrous ammonia directly into a storage tank, like on a rail tanker or something like that. So the point being is, like in a place like Hawaii, you don't need natural gas. You can still make this life-saving, important fertilizer for the rest of mankind, and it doesn't involve using any natural gas. The other thing about this is if you couple it with, let's say, a, a PPA, a power purchase agreement, and you buy some wind power contracts, when the wind is blowing, you can make anhydrous ammonia. When the wind's not blowing, you don't have to make any anhydrous ammonia. So it could be really inexpensive fertilizer, a lot cheaper than what it is today, just by using renewable energy, whether it's wind, wind turbines or solar farms. The sun is shining, it can make ammonia. The sun's not shining, I don't make them. It's as simple as that. So it's a process that you could turn on and off. You don't have to. You don't have to have any precursors or any heat up any reactor at the 900 degrees or anything like that. Just simply turning it on and off. And as long as your your temperatures maintain right around 70 degrees, it'll be efficient enough to use. So, so let me bring this home for the folks here in Hawaii to make it personal. If we use geothermal on the Big Island to make electricity. We could be making hydrogen. We could be making liquid hydrogen. We could be making ammonia. Um, and we could be exporting ammonia as fertilizer, or we could be exporting ammonia as the energy piece in a hydrogen system where you could split the ammonia back into its basic forms and use the hydrogen in stationary fuel cells to make electricity and things like that. In Japan, a lot of the hydrogen they're importing, because they, they have a high demand for hydrogen, they're trying to get rid of their old nuclear power plants. And for the meantime, they're, they're really pushing hydrogen. But they import ammonia from Canada and Australia, and they do it for the hydrogen. They, they, the hydrogen is shipped as ammonia. And then they, they just basically decouple it from the nitrogen back into hydrogen and use the hydrogen in their systems. So Hawaii could be not only self-sufficient with its own clean energy from wind power, solar power, hydroelectric and geothermal and ocean thermal and ocean motion and ocean turbines, you know, all the things we've talked about, but we could be helping um, get our own agriculture back into a sustainable mode by not having to import ammonia for fertilizer. We could be making our own fertilizer as well as exporting extra ammonia as an energy export to other islands, like the island of Oahu, that is kind of poor on, on uh, clean energy production resources like solar and wind, and is probably going to have to produce uh, electricity from some form 
coming from the neighbor islands, either wind or solar or whatever, and it would be easy to ship ammonia or uh, that uh, liquid hydrogen to do that. And this, the hard thing about liquid hydrogen, like you mentioned, is the minus 400 and something degrees Fahrenheit that you got to ship it in. And if you think about it, um, if you somehow slosh some liquid hydrogen onto you, um, you can kiss that limb goodbye because it would be instantaneous frostbite to the bone. So it's it's not exactly a safe thing to work with. So that's why the ammonia is actually kind of got a, a head start on liquid hydrogen because of cost and because um, of all the safety protocols that are already in existence to handle ammonia. Yeah, just to you know, to, to, to uh, push on you know what what Stan's talking about. We talked about for about using geothermal there in Hawaii, and also using sea turbines. And I I truly believe that in the future, I think Hawaii is going to be a big user of sea turbines because that's going to be a much more reliable energy source for you guys there in Hawaii. And that those sea turbines would provide you guys with more than enough power to do this ammonia thing. Now, why are we focusing on ammonia versus cryogenic hydrogen? Well, number one, cryogenic hydrogen, minus 423 degrees. You have to keep this stuff refrigerated. If you don't keep it refrigerated, you could end up with a very dangerous situation, very dangerous overpressure situation. Ammonia, to keep ammonia in a liquid state, only requires about 125 PSI. So it's much easier to transport, much easier to handle, right? Uh, I know that some people talk about some of the toxic issues and stuff like that, but understand here in Indiana where I live, farmers here have been using anhydrous ammonia for probably close to 100 years, safely I might add, right? Which versus uh, there aren't many places you're gonna find people using cryogenic hydrogen. One is the refrigeration. The other thing you need to consider when using cryogenic hydrogen is that it has to be heated up first before it'll even react with anything. Uh, there's another really cool thing that's going on that scientists are working on. They're actually trying to develop fuel cells that can use ammonia directly. Exactly. Okay. Yeah, exactly. So where they've taken basically some of these new catalysts, mix it with the platinum, these new catalysts. So, so going into the cell, it'll separate the nitrogen from the hydrogen, right? And then, so the output from this cell would be water and the other side would be just nitrogen gas. So. Uh, right, and so one of the things making this all practical is going to be it, it, uh, is this ammonia stuff is going to be very practical, and probably the most energy efficient way I can think of producing ammonia today that I can prove is actually using the electron dynamic compressors. One of the reasons why I actually built that compressor was really because of this ammonia issue, because I knew as we started having problems with natural gas, I mean, here in Indiana, we're already seeing some of the problems with natural gas and some of the um, shows with Stan. I know we've talked about some of the issues but just lead in, leading up to this year. Now, to my wildest dreams, I never thought that uh, these problems with natural gas would turn into a full-blown uh, energy crisis. But in Europe, they actually have. And if you want to know what the foundation of the energy crisis in Europe really is, it has to do with one reason. It, you have to ask, a, a number of years ago, obviously Europe had plenty of natural gas. What was the source of their natural gas? Does anybody ask that question? Well, the source of their natural gas was something called the North Sea. The North Sea peaked out in the late 90s. It's been terminal decline since then. That's an oil and gas field that's between Scotland and Norway. It's going dry. And one of the things I know I've been going back and forth with Stan about is uh, BP and other of these companies that own those old production platforms, they're trying to put wind turbines on them and sell them to green companies. And if you say, well, why are they doing that? Well, because they're liable for plugging up those wells and taking out those old energy platforms and it's going to cost them tens of billions of dollars. And they're trying to pump, push that cost off onto some of these green energy companies. And thankfully, these guys are smart enough not to not to buy into that liability. But that's that's a, the sad truth of what's going on in Europe. And we're watching this whole thing play out where you've got the old uh, petroleum companies on one side trying to get rid of a, a, a you know, a liability basically. And they're trying to make the rest of the public pay for this this liability. And I, I it's it's a sad situation in my opinion. I hope we don't have to go through uh, that whole situation here. We'll see how it all plays out. And and not to go too far 
further into national security issues, but now we start dragging China and Russia and the Middle East and, and all those energy players into this discussion. And it yeah. complicates the scenario greatly. So Dan, I'd like to thank you. We already hit our, actually we're a little yeah. bit over time right now, but you know, I think you did a great job of, of condensing a fairly complex uh, issue into you know, 28 minutes. And I really thank you for doing that. You're the only person I can think of that could pull it off. And, and I want to thank you. And um, we're going to be taking a two week break here at ThinkTech for the next two weeks. So we won't have any new shows for two weeks, but uh, I'm definitely going to have you back in the, in the next calendar year. And we're going to talk a lot more about a lot of these things. And maybe we can get some questions from the audience and talk some more about ammonia and um, compression. I think awesome. those two are, awesome. are great things. So Thanks again, Dan, and for everyone else, have a Merry Christmas and a great New Year, and we'll see you in 2022. Aloha.